Say, I'm a new creation. Come on, I am born of God. I'm born of the Spirit. You know, when you say it, say it with conviction. Right? Say it with what? Conviction. Hallelujah. I'm born of the Spirit. I'm born of God. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I see God. I know how to act. Christ in me. Glory on the earth. Come on, Christ in me. Glory on the earth. I am God's evangelist. I am God's temple. I am God's postcode. God lives here. Come on, God lives here. Confusion doesn't live here. God lives here. Direction lives here. Wisdom lives here. I am a new creation. I am born of the Spirit. I am God's home. Come on, I am God's home. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am God's priest. I am not a nobody. I am God's priest. Shout amen. amen. All right, we're getting into the scriptures. We're looking at liberality and it's part three. Father, we thank you for your word flows through. And those that hear will be changed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. And all trans flows in Jesus' mighty name. And that the social media team will have many things to cut out to send to other people. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You better, you better pray what you want if the person you're praying to is your father. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we thank you. Amen. All right, we're looking at liberality, and this is part three. We started off with our, 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 our scripture, John 3, 16. Because in knowing God, you know yourself. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God is a lover. God is a giver. That, and God is a sacrificial giver. Whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life so god's giving is with the other person in mind god's giving is with the other person in mind so your giving is with the other person in mind can i get a believing amen praise the lord church praise the lord and we are looking we are going in, a, in an interesting direction today you know asking the question what is god really after what is God really after? God is after your heart. What is God after? Your heart. You must understand this. God is after your heart. That is why what God did, God did with him. The first thing God dealt with was that God actually entered in. Amen. That's what God did. The first thing he did, that's why he gave man his spirit. Ezekiel 36, 26 tells us, a new heart. And a new spirit will I give unto you. And I will take away the stony heart of flesh out of you. And give you my spirit. Praise the Lord. What does God want from you? God wants your heart. Because when God has your heart, he has every other thing. Look at Mark 12. Mark 12. God wants your heart. Mark 12. I'm going to be reading from verse 13. We'll look at a couple of parables today, right? Verse 13. Mark 12, 13. Right? And they said unto him, certain of the Pharisees, of the Herodians, what did they want to do? To catch him in his words. So they wanted to tempt him. Right? And verse 14, and when they, came, when they were come, they said unto the master, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man. You see, they are trying to tempt him. Amen. Using good words. For thou regarded not the person of man, but you teach the way of God. You see, they were actually saying sweet things to God, to Jesus, but their intention was wrong. Right? It says, uh, you teach the way of God and in, in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Look at verse 15. 
Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, I pray for you today that your heart is more discerning so you can pick when hypocrisy is trying to deceive you. Amen. Church, amen. amen. Yeah. See how he answered. He answered and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring a penny that I may see it. Verse 16. And they brought it, and he said unto them, Whose image and subscription is on here? And they said unto him, It is Caesar's. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to the God the things that are God's. What is the thing that is of God? The heart of man. Amen. God is actually not after money. God is after your heart. Praise God. Church, praise God. God is not after money. God is just after your heart because your heart determines everything really. Look at Luke 12, 34. You know this scripture very, 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 you know it, you know it. Luke 12, 34. There is something about your heart and we need to look at it. Luke 12, 34. Is somebody in Luke 12, 34? Uh, maybe we should try to read it in the NLT version if we can. Oh, okay, because of our time. I have to run now. Luke 12, 34. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart... Okay, let's go again. Let's go again. For where your treasure is, there will your heart... Where your... You know you can interpret this thing in many ways, and you can use it as an evaluation. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Meaning, listen... Where you, I'm saying it again, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So we can say, if we want to know where your heart is, we look at what you do with your treasure. Amen? Church, amen. amen. Church, amen. amen. Another, listen, I'm saying it again. It might be an uncomfortable truth, but with your bank account, they should be able to know where, they will be able to know actually. Over four months, if they look at your bank account, they'll be able to know where your heart is. That's the truth. I'm talking about your, actually your disposable income. They'll know where your heart is. Praise the Lord. I don't, it's too early to start cracking jokes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but, but you get it. Praise the Lord. You, you know, when I say I won't do something, I end up doing it. You can't say, I love God, I love God, I love God. And they check your treasure. And they cannot see that. It's, that is hypocrisy. Because there is something about your heart. Your heart will go in the direction of what you treasure. Another way to look at this is if you wanted to treasure the things of God more. Put your treasure in the things of God. When you put your treasure in the things of God, your heart will, you, your heart will be there. You know that if you, if, let, um, it's, it's an example. It's not a big deal, but it's an example. You know if you put 10,000 pounds into the gospel, the gospel will be in your mind. It will be on your mind. You just say, well, well you, you'll be in church. you want to know what's going on. Because that's the way man is. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. That's why you realize, <coughs> when a man spends a lot to get a woman, touch the woman, you will see, <laughs> you will see that the man that is meek can shout. That's the way you are created. So God is not interested in your doings first. He's interested in your heart because the moment your heart is in the right place, automatically we'll see it in your doings. The hypocrisy in this generation is that we talk the talk because we think the talk can cover it up. But God says, listen, this is the, that is why God looks at the heart. Man looks at outward appearance and is really, really impressed. God looks at the heart. Because the moment the heart is right, it will flow out in what you do. Your treasure and your heart always are in the same place. Praise God. That is why one of the ways to break covetousness in your life before it actually comes on you is to be a giver. Because you are training your heart. To be in the things of God. 
You are training your, your heart to be people-minded. Praise God. Church, praise the Lord. Hey, I, I, hey, praise the Lord. Amen. You know, if, if you have a friend, you say, let me see your bank account. Let me see what you are spending on. And you say, ah, ah. Oh, wow. Because you're a believer. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know, it's nowadays we have friends that we can't tell each other the truth. Say, you know, my finances. No, no, no. Ah, we are believers. Amen. With my own friends, you know, we, we talk to each other. To, in those days before we got married, we tell each other there are some people we don't date, so we know. So when you are trying to like the person, we say, no, you don't go there. Amen. That's why you should have friends, godly friends. Praise the Lord. They, 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 a system of accountability. Because your heart is important. You know, one of the first things that should catch you when you are strange should be your friends. The things you are putting emphasis on nowadays. You used to be a lover of Jesus. You are turning into a Jesus body. They should be able to tell you. Quick. They should be able to tell you that we are noticing something. The things that you are emphasizing, meaning this is where your heart is. Hallelujah. That is why we, we always tell the believer, give your heart to the Lord. We tell the unbeliever, come and receive the life of God. We tell the believer, give your heart to the Lord. Because the moment your heart is with the Lord, there is something that does for you. It changes your desires. Amen. Church, amen. Church, amen. You know, it, 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 it's important that we talk about these things even though they are not convenient. The essence of this teaching is for you to actually have a, an evaluation. Praise God. What are you emphasizing? This your I love God should have fruits. The heart of a man. God is after the heart of a man. That's why he made you a new creation. He made you a new creation. He now tells you, my son, give me your heart. How do you give your heart to the Lord really? Is do you, get, you let the word of God have first place in your heart. What's going to happen is that we, we will be seeing fruits. What did you do? You gave your heart to the Lord. There is nobody that has given his life to the Lord or his heart to the Lord that is stingy. It can be. It doesn't work together. Praise the Lord. Why? For God love, God give. That heart is the mind that is in you. Let this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he became a man and humbled himself and sacrificed and died the death of the cross. Meaning, when your heart is right, sacrifice is normal. Amen. You know, comfortable Christianity is a cause. Might not like it. Comfortable is just about me. All about me. All about me. You actually are a cause in that what God wants to do through you is not able to do through you. Do you know there are many people that should be thanking God because you exist? We're going to get there next week. Because that's how God has, God has put his spirit on you. Put his spirit in you that you may now follow those godly desires. Amen. That's why, please write it down, the greatest disadvantage or the greatest blocker of a man fulfilling God's plan and purpose for his life is selfishness. That is the, that is, that is the self-afflicting demon that, that humanity has. That's why God came to deliver you from self. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 13. That's what God came to deliver you from. Self. What's the enemy? One of the major enemies of man. Self. All about me. That's why when you want to see a generation going down the drain, you start hearing, it's all about me, 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 me. How did that, the American culture get whapped? Me, me, me. Liberty. Me, me, me. That's how people get into trouble. Praise the Lord. What did God come to deliver you from? Self. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Hmm. Okay, we are in verse 14. For the love of Christ constrains us. What does the love of Christ do? It constrains us, but because we judge, if one man died for all, then all were dead. And he died for all, are like you in verse 15, that they which live should no longer live unto them. Church, are you, it's like, I know that, I knew that. I, I knew I experienced this kind of uh, reception. You should no longer live unto your, but unto who died for, unto him who died for you. Yeah, so you are not to live unto yourself. Praise the Lord. Living all for yourself is actually what God came to deliver you from. 
Praise the Lord. Church, praise the Lord. Yeah. Look at it. And that is why God will come at things that man holds very dearly. He will say, you cannot serve two masters. Luke 16. Let's look at that. Luke 16. Because I, 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 I'm not going to emphasize a lot of things much, but I would ensure that you have something to think about. Luke 16. Are you in Luke 16? All right, we are looking at verse 13. No man, someone say no one. No servant. No servant can serve two masters. Say God is the Lord of my life. Yeah, that's the believer. For you, he either he will do what? Hate one and he will do what? Love the other. Or else he will owe to one and he will despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 14. And the Pharisees also, who liked money, NLT, KJV, who were covetous, had all these things, and they scoffed at him. Now, the Pharisees were the leaders, spiritual leaders of the day. What is the point you're already seeing? He said you can't serve God and mammon. You know, have you ever heard someone teaching or saying something like, hmm, hmm. They didn't take it seriously. Like, say another one. Because the spiritual leaders of the days of Jesus were covetous people. They loved money. But they were acting like they were serving God. So God came in flesh and unearthed their hypocrisy. Your heart is not in this thing. You cannot serve God and money. You are created to use money to serve God. Meaning use money to expand the things of God. That's why when you consecrate your life to the Lord, God gives you his godly visions. His agenda, his will. Someone say, how much is much to spend on a soul being saved? You are the one that put value on it. Amen. The, the, the what for, of the soul of the pursuit for the kings of this kingdom is immeasurable. Because when Jesus will talk about his soul, Jesus, when Jesus would talk about his soul, he came to die for the soul. Can we get a believing amen? Look, at, he said it there. Um, you cannot serve God and money. And verse 14, they derided him. And look at verse 15. Very important. It's, and he said unto them, ye are they. We justify yourself before men. You know, a lot of people, and that's why in the age that we are in, a lot of people are very men-centric. What people will say. Amen. What people would what? Say, that's why you should have a right vision. Have a right vision where which is about what God says is the big deal in your life. Because God says there is a plague in town. You are always about what people will say. What people will say. What people will say is what drives your life. You are always looking. It's a symptom of a lack of relationship when you are all with the Lord. When you are always looking out for validation from men. It is the easiest way to get into a trap. When you want to dress, what people will say. You know the right way to dress, but because you want people to talk this way, you dress this way. You, you know how to act, but you don't act that way because of what people will say. What people will say. What people will say. You, it starts off small, but it starts to grow. It's a symptom of not a fellowship with the Lord. Amen. Church, amen. Look at what God says here in verse 15. Ye are they we justify yourself before men. But God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed, this is the reason why the believer should follow God's word. Look at what he says. For that which is highly esteemed in the sight of men. Is what? Abo Do you know the meaning of abomination? It's an abo the things that men carry on their heads. That's why you realize that one of the greatest tragedies of anyone's life is so do so well. Even to be healed in this world, that's what God did not say you should do at all. If God says you should be a doorkeeper, that's the best thing you should do. If God says you should be a governor, that's the best thing you should do. If God says you should be a preacher or a this and you become a footballer, it doesn't matter if you have all of the glory. What did God just call it? Abominable before his sight. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor, I have a Lord over my life. 
Come on, I want you to be convinced. I have a Lord over my life. So I have a Lord over my life. What have I said so far? Number one, I have said, God is after your heart. I have said, you cannot serve God and serve mammon. I have said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. I have said, if you want to even direct your heart to the things of God, if you feel it's not there, put your treasures in the things of God. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Another thing I want to say very clearly, God is not against prosperity. Neither is God for poverty. God is Against covetousness. Can we get a believing amen? Hey, can we get a believing amen? God is not against prosperity. He is not, a, he is not for poverty. What is God against? God is against covetousness. Luke 12, verse 15. Luke 12, verse 15. Very interesting story. I will start from verse 13. It's a story about a man. See, Jesus knew why he was here. Look at verse 13. And one of the company of them said, Master, are you here? Master, speak to my brother. Someone say, speak to my brother. Speak to my brother. Why should he speak to my brother? Let him divide the inheritance with me. How did Jesus respond? They called Jesus to an arbitration matter. What? And he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Is it, they said, Jesus, come and divide this thing. Come and tell my, my brother to divide it. He says, no, 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 no. Ah, no, no. I'm not into those things. I'm here to preach the gospel. If you want someone to divide your goods, you know where to go. Amen. Look at Jesus, because many people will bring many things to you, but you must know who you are. Yeah. Amen. And he now told him, in my own, me, it's not about your goods and services. My own is that you should take heed of covetousness. When it comes to things, God is not against having. God is not pro or against prosperity, as it were, or pro or against poverty. God is more interested in the conduct of a man when he has or he doesn't. That's why God said, it's not my own to talk about dividing properties. But you beware of covetousness. For a man's, I want you to be there, for a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things which he possesses. These are lessons about how to live that Jesus is talking about. He says, don't think that your value is based on what you have. Do you know in the world we are living in today, people actually get a sense of esteem from what they have? Listen, it, it, it looks funny. I came into this country when there was a subcrime credit crunch crisis. And it was strange to me because I was coming with a kind of Holy Ghost fire into the country. I realized that people lost all their earnings and were jumping and killing themselves from 10-story buildings. That's when I came into this country. And I was shocked at it. Because the point is, while I get that people might work for all that they've earned and amassed so far, the truth about it is that if he goes one day, he goes. The conduct of the believer is to say, well, if it has gone, it's not being flippant, but if this has gone, the God that brought me here, who get it all. You know the anxiety that believers have is because they don't trust in the Lord, honestly. That's why I said beware of covetousness. And men, you know, when I was in the university, when I was in the, in the secondary school, I attended King's College. And so in those days, right, if you were not wearing a Timbaland boot, you were not, you know, and you were not the cream de la cream of that era. 
You could not even talk to a lady. It had a sense of, and for people like us, my mom just thought, it's not that she couldn't afford it. She just thought, what is this bogus shoe that is so expensive, so I ain't buying it for you. But it, it was affecting my esteem. So I would see someone that I like, I say, I can't talk to you. No, I can't talk to you. I can't relate. I can't do all those things. I don't go to parties. Why? I don't have a Timberland shoe. Why? My mind was on what I own is what will make people accept me. And it might be true, but you must not take that into the kingdom that we're in. Get comfortable in your skin. Praise God. People are very, very other people-minded and what people will say minded. And because they think people value money, they create a mindset that they value people based on what they have. And also, before you know it, it becomes how you value people too. So, covetousness is saying, it's not about money. Come to a place that you honor people because they have character. No one should be clapping. But brother Toby, what's going on? Hey! Come to a place in your Christian work where which you actually say money is, we are not saying money is not important, but integrity. The fact that I can do business with a brother and then we are not praying and fasting and saying we're, we're, we're fasting to ensure it doesn't fail. It's not time to remit money. We are now speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues to know if you will remit money for business that if it was an unbeliever, we don't have those issues. We must come to a point where we, people are not okay around us, living in genuine lives, where we, we actually frown. Someone might be a billionaire, but we know that he's into fraud, and we say, no, this is not the way. We don't identify, don't like, wow, 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 wow. He comes into the meeting, you are not taking self. If I catch anybody doing this kind of thing, you know someone is a thief. You're not, you know, comes around, and you're not saying, wow, wow, snap with me, there'll be trouble. Because we were not trained that way. What do we honor? What does God honor? What is God's way? God, and, God honors love. God honors mercy. God honors people of character. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Church, praise God. He says, beware of it. Your life is all about what you can have. And you have that mindset in viewing people. And that's why people... It, it, and you must understand it. This is the reason why a lot of people borrow. That is why, the, that is why this system is okay. Apart from businesses that use it to leverage to do great things, many people are in a lot of debt today. Buying things they don't need to impress people that don't really like them. I'm telling you, you know you cannot afford that car, but you know if I turn up in the Bugatti, they will look at you differently. So you go and get it, and you are struggling. Many people are doing this, living in houses they cannot afford, cars they cannot afford, different things. What is the, the, the talking to you today? Beware of covetousness. For your life is not, be okay saying, you know what, there is nothing, but I know God is with me. The Bible says Joseph was a prosperous man. God, that was the definition of God about Joseph in the prison. Because prosperity is God with you. Prosperity is not things with you. Prosperity is God with you. Amen. Amen. Church, amen. That is why the Bible will say they attacked uh, uh, the son of Abraham. He digged another well. They attacked him again and took off the well. He dug another one. They attacked him again. He dug another one until he got to a place. He said, oh, he dug another one. They didn't come and attack him. He said, we are going to array a boat. It doesn't matter what happens. Who we are is not a function of what we have. Who we are is a function of who is with us. Brother, beware of covetousness. How did Paul talk about this? I am okay to abase and abound. I have learned it. Praise God. Look at Philippians 4. I have learned it. We are talking about liberality, but we are actually talking about the kind of things that we should look out for. Look at Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Tell anybody about no more pressure. Yeah, no more, don't, don't live under pressure. Amen. No more pressure, no. Amen. Life is in stages, men are in sizes. Praise God. Amen. No, no pressure. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. No more pressure. Amen. <laughs> All right, there are many stories I could say. Hmm. Hallelujah. Look at, look at, look at Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in respect of want, but I have learned. Someone say I've learned. In whatsoever state I am where we to be content. What have I learned? 
In my, what will God teach you if you are walking in the word? Contentment. Meaning that covetousness, a love of money, and a flippant, you know, a flippant focus on money is a symptom. It's a symptom of a relationship problem. God's working with you, he starts to work on, he starts to work on that issue, covetousness. He said, I'm working with the Lord. What will God, I have learned it. In whatsoever state I am in, to be content. You are not a believer that we know what is in his bank account based on how, he, how, he, how his face is. You know there's a proof that he's on their face. It's there. Don't say, no, that's how I am. You can read it from my face. No, you're a new creation. We know you no longer after the flesh. We know you no longer after, after mood. We, don't, we, we know you no longer after bed signs. What was that thing? Aquitarius and uh, Sagittarius. And, uh, we don't know you after that thing. We know you as a new man in Christ. Don't give yourself excuses of carnality to behave anyhow. Say glory to God. I don't know what will happen tomorrow, but glory to God. God is with me. Our kingdom, God is with me, is equals to prosperity. Pro because pros what am I saying? I am saying that God is with you. That is the definition of prosperity. Things are not the definition of prosperity. Because you can get into a situation where we think it's not what you need. Things cannot sort it out. But God will sort it out. I get what I'm saying. God with me is prosperity. God with me. I remember my valedictory speech when I was leaving the, the nation of Nigeria and my disciples were asking me, you're going to a nation you have never been. Why are you this confident? I told them, I will not forget that speech. I said, I don't know what tomorrow is, but I know that there's someone that is with me. He knows tomorrow and is with me. I'm fine. Left everything and left them. The point is, why? I left Nigeria physically with zero, you know some people always say their story that they'll be crying. I came into this country, they'll say they came with 50 pounds. Some say, I came into this country, someone say 150 pounds. I came with no money of mine, but I, was, I came in rich, very rich. What, what, what do I mean? I say, God is with me. You know, one of the first things I realized in this country was that, anyway, it, 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 you see, you might not like it that way. I am saying that prosperity is going to be with you. What I do, so I go to places where it is difficult to find parking. It's just difficult to find parking anywhere I go. And I said, I'm a, I'm a rich man. God is with me. Lord, from today, anywhere I go, go and be finding parking before I get there. Send your angels there. He said, can you do that? God is with me. That's my point. And guess what? So that it's, it's complete. A day can come and there's no parking. It doesn't change that God is not with me. Are you getting it? He doesn't say, ah, God was with him last week, oh. This week, we are. Because you must, I have learned in whatsoever state. That's the point. It's not me. It's Paul. I've learned in whatsoever state to not to abase and abound. The shouting point of your life is not your business revenue. The shouting point of your life is not your work. The shouting point of your life is Christ is with me. Amen. No matter where I am, he will not leave me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Because what Tense men, get men stingy, anxious, is that they are forgotten his presence with them. Tell your neighbor you're a prosperous man. For God is with you. Amen. The guy said in Philippians 4 verse 11, I have learned in whatsoever state to be content. What does it mean? Verse 12. I know both how to abase. I also know how to abound. Everywhere. In all things, look at it. I am instructed both to be full and to be angry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13 is where people like to quote. I can do it. It then says, I could do all these things. In the original rendering, I can do all these things, meaning I know how to abase and abound. I can do it through Christ. Who does what? Strengthens me. So Christ is my strengthener that makes me able to abase and abound in the midst of plenty or lack. Praise God. Church, praise God. So God, God is just against covetousness where men put money before him. Praise God. That's what God is against. Where men put money and make decisions. They make decisions of their lives around things, but they are thinking about other things before him. Praise the Lord. Church, praise the Lord. You know, and, and this is important because if we don't talk about covetousness, right, 
and talk about the state of your heart to get you to evaluate, you might just keep living your life. You might just keep living your life because, you know, when a, uh, a, 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 a person is in a, in a state of rest, except he hears maybe much more new information, he doesn't have the will to go further. That's why we are bringing the information to you. Amen. That's why you, you need to hear, and that's why, sorry, that's why Paul would actually talk to the saints about other saints in other places. That's what happened in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul will say, I'm writing to you, the Corinthians, about what is happening in Macedonia. In Macedonia, those people were giving, but they learned giving because I told them about your giving. Now, some of the Macedonian brethren are coming with me. I am telling you so that you can prepare yourself and so that by the time they come, they will see the giving that I told them about. So the Macedonian church that we all shout about lent giving because Paul told them that in the Corinthian church they were givers. That is why, you know, and that is why it's important for us to talk about what others are doing. Praise the Lord. That is why if you look at any of Paul's writings, Paul will say, help me greet Phoebe. Romans 16. Help me greet uh, uh, um, Aquila and Priscilla. Who for, the, who for my life they gave their necks? Why was he writing it to the church? So that other people will know. So, you know, sometimes you get to a point you thought you have, you have done the best. And God will show you, no. How far do you want to go in this thing? Amen. Praise God. He says, help me greet Typhina and Typhosa. Meaning there are some, we're talking about liberality. We're talking about giving. There are some people who were there. And it was because of them Paul could do all Paul was doing. There was a, so because when we talk about liberality and a lifestyle, people always think it's about giving all the time in terms of money. There were some people who they, were, they wanted to beat up Paul. They are sworn that if they catch Paul, they will kill him. Some people have to put Paul in a basket in the middle of the night and put with a rope to get him down so that he can escape and run away from the place. I'm talking about people who God has inspired to help somebody fulfill his mandate. You know, every one of us sitting down here have this kind of different people in our lives that God is looking up to us to do something that they might get to where they need to get to. It's true. But guess what? If life is only about you, you will not notice. Amen? Amen? If you, are, if you are always giving excuses, the day they need to put Paul down, you say, ah, no, 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 no. I have a match to watch. That's how the apostle now has been captured. You say, why did they capture the apostle? Because you were supposed to be there to put him in a basket and put him down so he can run away. Are you getting what I'm saying? I'm saying to you that the reason why we are talking about covetousness is that covetousness will short circuit the will of God, the plan of God, and the purpose of God. Are, are, we, are we here together? Church, are we here together? Say, I have learned, I have learned to abase and abound. Praise God, I have learned to abase and abound. Let us look at this particular uh, um, parable by Jesus. Very, very important parable. This is the parable where after Jesus spoke to them about covetousness, right? Jesus then started to tell them about someone you will know. Is called a rich fool. It's important you pay attention to this parable because we need to know who Jesus will call a fool. Amen. Church, if this is the example before, after I spoke about covetousness, it means that the rich fool was a covetous man. So it means that to be covetous is to be foolish. Amen. Let's look at what the problem of this man is. Verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them. The ground of a rich man brought forth plentifully. Like I told you, God is not against people doing well. And he thought, what is the issue? How men think. How men think. The heart. Look at it. He thought in his heart within himself, what shall I do? Because I have no more room where to store my fruits. Verse 18, he said to himself, this is what I will do. I will build down, I will, I will pull down my bands. I will build a greater one. You will have thought God is against expansion. Follow. And there will I bestow all my goods. See where the problem now is, verse 19. And I will say to my soul. Have you been seeing that it was all about 
me, 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 me. I will, I will. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. What God said to this guy, oh fool, you will die tonight. Now God did not say because of what he did, he will die. God was just saying, I know, but you don't know. You will die tonight. So you fool. You, you, what did you do? You amassed everything. Only to say soul. God now says, that's foolish. Who is the wise man to God? Follow it. Follow. And you know we must be hard on these things. Look at it. It says, it says the man said in 19, so thou hast much laid up for many years. God is not against saving. God is not against expansion. God is against selfishness. Amen? God, I'll say it again. God is not against savings. God is not against expansion. God is against selfishness. Look at it here. He says, so, I have much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Who shall have all those things that you now have gotten? Verse 21. So is he. Are you there? So is he that laid up treasure for himself. And is not? Church, and is not? The, the man that is not rich towards God already shows that his heart is not with God. God says this man is a fool. Praise God. This is Jesus speaking parables. And what was he talking about? Covetousness. But guess what? You are a new creation. Say, I am a new creation. Say, I am a new creation. I am born of the Spirit. I'm a giver by nature. You know, and that is why a lot of people always are into the, um, 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 the argument about tithe. Should a believer tithe? Should a believer not tithe? I always tell people, except you are giving more than the tithe, you should not be part of the conversation about should people tithe because most of the time, the intent is not genuine. It's not. But we're going to look at it biblically. Amen. Church, amen. A amen. We are talking about the kingdom, I always say, the kingdom needs to move forward. Things need to be done. How, let me answer the question uh, from the Old Testament. How did God ensure that the priests in the Old Testament and the temple was taken care of? How did God do that? God did it by systematic giving of the saints. Praise God. What is that systematic giving? It's a tithe. Amen? Church, amen? God did it by, see, so we are going to see it from scriptures. Now, let's just look at uh, um, the book of Exodus 26. Is it Exodus 26? I even want to. Deuteron Let's look at Deuteronomy 26 so that you see something there. Because one of the things we, need, we must know is God would write to a hardened people of what he wants to happen that they will not do if he doesn't tell them. To give us an instruction of how we should live. Amen? Church, amen? Amen? Okay, let's look at Deuteronomy 26. Just like, for example, in Exodus 20, God will say, do not build altars that have steps. If you build an altar that has, has steps, people can walk up that altar and people on the ground can see their nakedness. And I don't want anyone to see anybody's nakedness, so don't build an altar that has steps. That's already God telling people that he doesn't want women or men or anybody loosely dressed. Amen? Well, in the Old Testament, they will have a law. Nobody here must build an altar. Why? We don't want to see when someone is going up, you're down, you see the person's uh, underwear. So God said no scale. But now, do we have altars? Yes. Why? Because the point is that the way we dress now, we don't particularly dress in skirts all the time. Can we get a believe in amen? All men and women in those days, they dress in what? Skirt. You are going upstairs and it's always closed. The, the fellowship closed. So if someone is walking up the stairs of the altar, they can see the person's under. It's just, so why, what is the point there? The real point there for you and I today is not to say no altar, no altar. Amen? It's to say that God is against people operating in nakedness. Amen? That's how you read the law to make sense to you. So when he's talking about tithing, what are you thinking about? You are thinking about God is providing a continuous, systematic way where with the things in the kingdom will not suffer. So most people now don't have systematic giving. Are shouting they are New Testament believers, but they don't give. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? And, it, and they for, they've forgotten the lesson that was in the writings of Moses. Because the, these people that... He said, when I want to do something, I have to get the people to, to do it because of the way their heart is. So you can, oh, I, I, can, I can see what God is trying to say there. God will say, thou shalt not speak wrongly to your parents. Any under the law, because he doesn't want them to do it. Anybody that speaks wrongly or slaps his parent, cut his hand. And the point is nobody goes there. You should know today that there is something about your parents that God is, all, is separate about. Listen, I'm not saying you should joke with everybody, but your parents are not people you joke with. Whether they did you good or they, didn't do you, they don't do you good. In our kingdom, God honors that you honor your parents. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because you will, you will learn it from the things that he says and the things, that he, the things that he's saying to the Jews. You will now say, okay, he's bringing this thing up because he knows the way these people are. You get a lesson from it. Are you getting what I'm saying? So I'm a New Testament Christian. This one does not apply to me. No, do you have systematic giving in your life? What was he teaching them? He told them, when you get your earnings, the first part of your earnings, read Deuteronomy 26, we can't go there. The first part of your earnings, someone said the first part. He said the first part of your earnings, take it to the priest. Meaning that God actually wants you to put him first in your earnings. That is how you are different from people of the world. When I earn, some might say it's direct debit, but it's no mortgage that goes out first, it's Jesus that goes out first. Are you getting it? That is the what, why is that happening? We are believers. Amen. Just like in the Old Testament, you say the first that you get, which was the tithe then, you say, take it to the priest first. Before you do anything, take it to the priest and go and tell the priest, I was a slave in Egypt with my fathers. And the Lord God promised, please pay attention, the Lord God promised that he would rescue my fathers and bring them into a good land. And now, today, I am in the land. I bring this tithe to acknowledge that God is a faithful God who did what he said he would do. Right? And the Bible will now tell us in the book of Deuteronomy 26, use that tithe to take care of the Levites, use it to take care of the temple, you take care of the priests, you take care of the widows, you take care of the orphans. Amen? Systematic giving. What about you? You were in the world. God rescued you from darkness. Brought you into his own kingdom, the real Kenna land. Amen? So when we set apart our earnings for the Lord, what are we doing? We are saying we are the people that have inherited the promise that God said. Amen. So my point is, so when we get into the New Testament, he will not tell them, ensure you give it tight. Because he trusts the spirit inside of you. What did he tell them? 1 Corinthians 16. I want you to be there. Because there is a way people talk about giving that is not genuine. So the point there is when you earn, the first person you set aside for is Jesus. Not things. Why? You are not of the world. There is a difference between you and the people of the world. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. Because we must understand that everything in the New Testament was gotten from the Old Testament. Just explain in the light of Christ. So if you just go and say, I'm not in the, I'm not in the, you will miss the point that God is trying to make in types and shadows. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. Now, verse 1. Concerning the collection, a few more minutes, 15. Concerning the collection for the saints, I have given order. Someone say order. Say in, in, in Christ, there are orders. Someone say, I'm under, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm under grace, no orders. You are disorderly. Look at it. There is an order. How will we know that you're a Christian? It affects how you live. It affects how you give. Amen. Church, amen. amen. Am I too fast or you don't like the teaching? Which one? Eh? You know, Brother Toby, I've always told you, these difficult teachings that we have, you have to be there saying, ah, but you even start and say, hey! Tell me deeper. Tell me look at and say, hey, hey, hey. is he getting it and I'm not getting it? Yeah, hey, yeah. Because whether you like it or not, there are difficult sayings that must be said. If not, we are going to get to a place where which loose living is common. And we say, no, we're under grace. The kingdom of God that needs to be expanded is not happening because we can't tell people the truth. 
We are afraid to tell them the truth because if we tell them the truth, they will get offended. Not here. Amen. First Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, the same principle that you see in Deuteronomy 26. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches. Someone says order to the churches. Order even so do you upon the first day. First day was when they earned. Upon the first day of the week, let ev- how many people? Every one of you lay by him in store. As God has prospered him, so that when I come, there will be no gatherings. What does this mean? It means that for you, giving must be more planned than spontaneous. Amen? Church, amen. Church, amen. Amen. There are some times that God will prompt you and say to you, give this. It was not in the plan. But much more, the normal everyday operations is that giving is planned. You plan it. It says from the first day of the week, meaning, and that was because they were weekly laborers. When you get your earnings, the first thing you do, if you go and look at Deuteronomy, it will also tell you, when you get your earnings, the first thing you do, it's in this, it's in this new era that the last thing you do is give God. In the, and, that, and I always tell people, you need to understand that when the will of God is not going as it ought to go, we need to go back to the word to see what is wrong. Because God would always, you know, God told me I always provide for everything I command. Everything. Right? See, now look at it. You say, in the first day of the week, Let's go uh, as let the man lay in store as God has prospered him. As God has prospered him. So the point now would be, like I've said before, does God look at your givings in percentages? Yes, he does. He does. It is flippant teaching that say he doesn't. He does. There are some there are some people that have there's an expectation of how they should give because it is as God had prospered. So, for example, God would tell us, God is not pro or against big or small giving. But God is against the giving that comes from the heart. That comes from, look, let me show you. Mark 12. Mark 12. Mark 12. We are going to see the story, the very famous story that people rarely read. Mark 12. We are looking at the story of the woman uh, the widow's might. Hmm? Okay? Let's look at it. Oh, do, 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 do. Where is this now? Right? Um, it's somewhere there. I'll tell the story as I'm telling the story to come to my head. That's how I work anyway. Okay? Anyway, the story of the widow's might is that the Lord God was um, looking at how people give. As he was looking at how people give, thank you, 41. Okay? Right? Okay. And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and he beheld how the people give into the treasury. Many that were rich cast in much. From the point of view of the world, they will say the rich people that gave are the ones that are... Look at what God will say. Verse 42. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make it a father. And he called unto him his disciples. When he calls his disciples, he wants to share a lesson. He's, he's the one that called them. He said, look at this. That poor widow has cast more in than all they that have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, verse 44, but she of our want did she cast in, even all her living. Are you noticing that there? Church, are you noticing this here? Jesus was the one that stopped what the disciples were doing to tell the disciples that listen, so that you understand how I see giving. God sees giving as to how you earn. That is why percentages make sense. That is why if you're a smart Christian, you would have a budget. 
If you're a smart Christian, you believe in systematic, serving God systematically while you are open for spontaneous, meaning you will set it aside. That's why he helped the Jews set it aside by telling them, for you guys, you guys, so that you are not, you will not say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Start, you give 10. And not only did they, were they to give 10, there was also burnt offering, grain offering. While all of these things point to Christ, which we're going to talk about on, our, on another day, the point there is, they did those things. And in doing those things, they took care of God's temple. Amen? They took care of God's temple, God's priest. In 2 Chronicles 31, the Bible tells us that the, the priest in the house went to look for what to do because nobody was dropping anything in the temple. Praise God. And then the Bible says a king came called King Ezekiah and changed everything and said, we are going back to the order of the Lord. In this whole nation, everybody that has something that has, is earning, come and ensure that you give a tent so that the temple, the work of God can continue. That was how the, um, the temple of God in the time of Ezekiah came back. They renovated the place. God, the worship of God and the pointing to Christ reemerged. Not because he was not always there, but because people backed away from the order God has given. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, and God now comes to you. Now says when he comes to you, there is an order for you. The first person in your life is Jesus. When it comes to your treasures, the first person you actually set aside is Jesus. If you're not doing it that way, it's disorder. They will, it will not beat you. But when you're shouting, let the will of God be done, God will be pointing and saying, that's the reason the will of God is not, because you are not availing yourself. When God wants to build the temple, when he wanted to build the temple in Exodus 25, he, to, he gave the people the blessing in Egypt. He asked for it in Exodus 25. The Bible says they gave to the point that they said, no, we don't need givings anymore. I am saying that there is nothing God asks of to do on earth today for his kingdom that he has not provided for. He has provided it for it. But guess what takes it away that we don't see it? Where we started off from? Covetousness. Praise God. Where men are more into things and self than the things of God. That's why God will open his mouth and say, that man is a rich fool. Then you now understand that, oh, God makes a man rich and all he was thinking about was to just build something for himself and rest. When he could have used it to empower the things that pertains to the things of the kingdom, what does God call him? A rich fool. You know, this one I've not said gives to God so that God will give you something. Because while I know that man needs motivation to give, we must start to teach people that something is right, full stop. Amen. Spiritual growth is not always trying to say, where is the reward? Where is the reward? It's just something is right. That's it. It's right. That's what to do. Jesus is first. It's right. Simple. But you know what? Because, and that's how people get deceived. People have itching ears. That's why somebody then tells you, if you give God this, God will do this. People now bring out calculator and say, ah, honey. You know that 100 pounds we have is not enough. You better let's give it so that God can give us. Then nothing happens. Right? And when nothing happens, people get angry. The truth about it is that when people give, God blesses. Sometimes they give, he blesses. The truth about it is that, let me let it be clear to you. If your mind is always on the result from the giving, you will not be in God's will. That's the point. You must be more interested in being in God's will than having. It's a difficult saying. Well, hello, that's why many are not growing in Christ. You must be interested in, I want to know what is right, O oh Lord, and I'm doing it. Don't get it wrong. I did not say God does not do. I said, as a believer, that's what God calls righteousness. He said, your righteousness endures forever. We are people that have been made right to do right. Because at the end of the day, Jesus went to die. But do you know that there's a tendency that nobody will have believed? We could have preached this gospel and everybody said, to hell with you, Jesus. But he did. So from the point of view of Jesus, all he's to do is that he's to do right. Make it available. Do right. Then we trust later that people will take advantage of it. When we take, they take advantage of it, we say glory to God. It's not that we are now always about the result, the result, the result, the result. What that does is that it makes us spiritual contractors. It's not popular, but it's the truth. 
It's not popular. It's the truth. And so at the end of the day, you realize that. That's why I always say genuine lovers don't go around the conversation of uh, tight things. Should we do 10? Should we do 14.2? No, it is the, it, the genuine lover is like God. What more can be done? The genuine lover is like God. And let me tell you something, because God sees the heart. My brother, if you are not doing now, don't say, Lord, when I become a billionaire, I, I, I will buy the stadium for you. No, God doesn't want you to buy the stadium, because God knows that if you are not able to give your one pound, you cannot give your one million pounds. That's when you hear God say, give one million pounds, you faint. It will not be emergency services pumping the heart. It cannot contain it. Why? Because, and he, had, he was once saying, Lord, when I make it, when I make it. No, God sees the heart. And the heart is the heart that wants to do for Jesus. I, I want you to, as we close in this service, you know, just close your eyes and picture a vision of God's plan, of God's message around the world of Europe, around the whole of America, of men and women, you know, giving their lives, giving their resources. Picture this thing. Where which people are not having prayer points to buy building. Where which, and you will have taught, where is the finances if we needed a building? It's with the saints. It has always been. There is no point in any generation throughout the Bible that people had any need that was not with the people. When the people reconsecrate themselves back to the Lord, in the time of Hagar, in the time of uh, uh, Moses, in the time of Ezekiah, any time God never says people should do something without the people being empowered. But when covetousness is there, and you have, it, it, you know, I don't want to use personal experiences to prove the point, but the point is the blessed man is the consecrated man. Is the man that... Is the man that says, Lord, you, you know the simpler way to live life? Knowing that God has a blue plan and saying, God, what do you want us to do? All your needs, that people, all the things that people chase about, becomes the reality of a consecrated man. Because sometimes you need to understand it, that it will not be easy to stay consecrated. But you said, uh, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. This is the journey. This is the way. You know, consecration was a time where which actually was in a particular church, very prosperous, and God said, Micah 2.10, it's time for you to arise and leave. Leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. Wow. How will I do this? The, the youngest ordained, so to speak, you know, they used to wind us then, they were like the anointed of his time. What? He said, leave. Leave that place. It's time to do this. What will I end? He didn't say anything. What will I feel? He didn't say anything. But I'm trying to tell, that's why I don't want to use story, but I'm trying to tell you We've not begged. It's not because we are bragging. I'm just trying to tell you that uh, everybody is trying to take care of themselves. Let God take care of you. Amen. Let him take. I'm not saying that be oblivious of your bills. I am just saying that there is God being first is righteousness. That's all. God being first is what? Righteousness. The funny thing about it is that he will not come and beat you. He will only come and teach you. He will give you his word. And that's all. He sent his word. And what did the word do? The word healed them. Who did the word heal? Depending on opening his heart to receive God's word. Hebrews 2, Hebrews 4 2. The same word that was preached unto us was preached unto them. The same word did not profit them, having not been mixed with faith. Rise upon your faith. We are them of those who mix God's word with faith. Father, we give you praise. Father, we give you glory. Father, we thank you because we are men of the Spirit. We lent liberality in you. Father, thank you. Let us pray again today in this service as we close. Right? Let us pray that your heart is strengthened to do God's will. I want you to pray right now. Right? Your heart is strengthened to do God's will. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to pray that your heart is strengthened to do God's will. I just want us to pray for anyone here or anyone that will be hearing us who is listening to this thing and may have needs that overshadow their mind. And they are most likely thinking, what is... If only I just had like needs, even the saints can supply. So let us pray for those ones as well. Let's pray in the name of Jesus Christ that they will experience miracles. 
They will experience, I know that you praying, you have seen a miracle of God. The Bible says we comfort them with the same comfort where which we have been comforted. I want you to open your mouth and pray for people right now in this home in this house who might have one need of the other that might be biting that might be important that might be crucial someone might need a miracle that needs to appear in the next few days but the person is in church today yes 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 let's pray for that brother let's pray for that sister in the name of Jesus Christ, someone might be here. And like I said, everything is not money. They just need to make a decision. They need to know what to do. Let's pray for them. That they walk in the wisdom of God. Amen. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that they are the right place at the right time. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we just thank you because of your love and your care for us. You have always said we should cast our cares on you. For you care for us watchfully and affectionately. So we shall not fear what men say unto us. For you are our helper, you are our keeper. So we do not embrace covetousness. For you have said, so we may boldly say, The Lord is our helper, whom shall we fear? What can man do unto us? Thank you because you help. You've helped and you always help. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name and the saints say, and the saints say, go to someone this particular morning and, or afternoon and go tell them, you are blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed in Jesus' name. You are God's postcode. You are God's liberal man. You are that man. God bless you and have a lovely week. Amen.